Greetings, fellow scribes. Welcome back to the archive. It is the second Wednesday of January. Time for a archival GMing. This month, I continue my series on world building tips by talking about deity selection. Next week, I'm going to be talking about culture. And I am going to touch on culture a little bit this week. Mostly because deity selection and culture are kind of interchangeable on where you put them. And you're kind of doing a little bit of culture selection as you're doing deity selection. Or you're doing deity selection a little bit when you do culture selection. So whichever order you do these two in, it really doesn't matter. You're still going to get the same basics. You're just going to, one is bottom up and deity selection is top down. So sit back, relax, and enjoy as we talk about picking deities for your world. As I did last month, I'm going to start this discussion talking about two specific worlds. The first world I made, and the Pathfinder game that I had run a campaign in. And then, of course, after those, I will we'll go to our step-by-step -step building world portion. So with that said, let's get right into this, shall we? So, on the first world I made, understand, again, this world is very much the I was a young baby GM and still really didn't know what the heck I was doing. I do find I still go to some of the ideas from this, but basically deity selection and culture really weren't big factors in this world. It was just islands that can fly. And so pretty much the deity selection for it was, if it's in a book, it's good. Don't have to justify it or anything. It's all good. It's all there somehow, somewhere. That was pretty much that world. If I were to do it again, I would do it very differently. But... We all started off somewhere. Now, the Pathfinder game world, the one where the core concept was everything you know is wrong, I kind of didn't keep to that for the deities. Sort of. You see, on this world, each race was modeled off of a sort of romanticized version of a different culture. So the the gnomes of Zurich they were modeled off an amalgamation of uh, Three Musketeers movies and a dash of inspiration from uh, Sparks in the Girl Genius comics by Professors Foglio. Yeah, I, I will take inspiration where I find it. So, other than the fact that they worshipped, like, all the races, the dragon that created them, they didn't really have a major sort of religious setup. They worshipped Zur, the god of innovation and creation. And also the dragon who created them. And whose city that Zurich is named after. Um, of course, the halflings were based off of Germanic tribes. And so... I tended to go towards the the Germanic versions of the Norse deities with them. The elves 
were a very interesting case in that the groups that were most likely to have organized religions followed the Egyptian pantheon. And it really gets down into bits of their culture as to how this worked. See, they actually had five great cities at one time. Each one of these cities was named after a god. And each one of these cities somehow embodied the philosophy of that deity. You know, Mar Anuba, Mar the city of Anubis, was the city of the dead, the city where the crypts of the great elven leaders were kept. Mar Toth was the city of libraries, of scribes. Mar Ptah is the moving city. Mar Amun was the crowning jewel of the High Elves. A city of tragedy. But that's beside the point. Um... And it was, so the High Elves and the Grey Elves both followed the Egyptian pantheon, even though the High Elves were more modeled off of the romanticized Western stereotypes of the Roma, with some unique twists put on to differentiate them from them. Anyway, so that's how I picked the deities there. I looked for what culture each race was following and their deities followed from that. This led to a interesting thing, but there was one subtle difference. There was one not tied to any of these existing religions. The church. The Church of the Wheel. This was the cleric of a philosophy type thing. But the Church of the Wheel focused on the idea of the drive towards freedom. The turning of the cycles of the wheel will also lift people up from the oppression of regimented hierarchies and all that. It was basically an anarchistic church that actually embraced that idea through a idea of patience and perseverance. But that's it for the two examples. Let's get to our step-by-step -step world, shall we? So we're looking at our step-by-step -step world. We haven't named this world. Really, naming a world isn't that important to me. You can just pretty much get away calling any world Terra and be done with it. But... Last time we discussed the main themes for this world. Themes of duality, of the conflict between wild and civilization, of everything swinging towards the extremes. And this led, of course, to our three races, human, elf, and the middle ground of dwarf. So, how do we work out the deities for something like this? Our deities are going to be extremes. In most instances. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with just a quick rundown on humans. Alright, 
humanity we know is in the case of they are in cities and trying to keep the wild at bay. So, they're a hierarchical society, obviously. So, we're going to create a god of rulership. But, rulership kind of has its own sort of sways here. So, our ruling deity isn't going to be one deity, but it's going to be two. The Lord and Lady of the Chalice. And when you, the people who worship this deity worship both aspects. But this is sort of a representation of the duality of rulership. The Lord of the Chalice is the war god, the, the general, the one who seeks to build the walls and train the troops and lead men into battle. The Lady of the Chalice, this is going to be the one who focuses on the more nurturing aspects of rulership. The, the quest for knowledge, the seeking for innovation, and the making sure people are fed, the, the duties of leadership. So we'll end up later on picking the correct sort of bits for these deities, but you're going to be operating on that philosophy with them. Now then, we come down from them, and we need to start looking at some other deities to fill out this pantheon. Well, we have a world where you have an inherent conflict in nature. And there are going to be those who, among humanity, who see this as a struggle for strength and survival. So how do we want to represent this? Pain. We're going to make one of the deities for the humans, Leviatar, the classic maiden of pain herself. This is a great point because this is a deity that anyone who's played multiple editions of D&D will know and will have some sort of connection and gut reaction to. But we're not going to keep her the same. We're not going to make her evil. We're going to make her neutral. Because our Lady of Pain, our Leviathar, she's not about just inflicting pain and suffering for the sake of inflicting pain and suffering. She's doing it for a purpose. She's doing it to strengthen you. Because that which does not kill me makes me stronger. And she drives her followers to strengthening through the pain of conflict, of loss, and just of physical pain. But also pain is a spiritual connection. Pain causes one to transcend your flesh, to seek and attain higher states of consciousness. So pain is actually an act of prayer. And this Leviathar, like I said, is not evil. She's not about going out inflicting any pain on unwilling people. It is a act of submission to her. An act of trying to strengthen yourself. 
to drive yourself beyond what you are. So, we have that. That is our Leviathan. And yes, that's the thing. You can easily take an existing deity and change her. Or him. Whichever you prefer. Now, we have that extreme. We have the extreme of pain. So, we're going to counter Leviathan with a god of healing. Let's... Let's pull from somewhere else, shall we? Actually, let's not pull from anywhere. Let's just create a god whole cloth. Where Leviatar is about pain, this god will be about soothing pain. Where Leviatar is about injury, this god is a god about healing injury. Where Leviatar is about the ecstasy of pain, this deity will go another direction. Actually, let's just go ahead and make this one a deity of hedonism, of the pleasures of the flesh, to go to counteract Leviathar's mortification of the flesh. And so, with that, we have a a god that would be the patron of the sex workers. And this deity will be important in the world, just as Leviathan is, because Leviathan provides the strength that pushes people on, the drive to know that they can always keep standing. This other deity provides the hope, the reason to keep standing, to keep coming back, even when you ultimately want to give up everything. And I don't have a name for this. We would figure this out ourselves. But at this point, we've got three deities as a starting place. And we would keep working down. And each of these deities is going to work on determining the culture. Work on setting up how the people of this land think. So, next month, we'll be talking about how we show these deities into the world. How they affect and determine the culture. So, until then, I'd like you all to remember to have fun and keep gaming.